Hello, awesome students. It's Dr. Foltz. Today, I'm going to talk about John Winthrop, and I'm going to talk about model of Christian charity, as well as how both Winthrop and Christian charity impact the United States today. So when we think about John Winthrop, we're probably thinking about him as one of the most influential, one of the most impactful um, figures within the early colonial period of the United States. But if you talk to Winthrop himself, he probably would have been surprised by that because he described his early years uh, as a young man, as someone who was wild and dissolute. Those are his words. And it wasn't until later on that he acquired, I'm going to use his words again, they acquired an insatiable thirst for God. And that latter part's important because that insatiable thirst, as he describes it as, that's going to impact how he governs, of course, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But it's also going to impact really the future aspirations as well as the philosophical worldview of the United States, which, of course, we'll talk about a little bit later on. Now, Winthrop himself was born to a wealthy family in Suffolk, England in 1588. Uh, by the time he's 14, he's going to roll into Trinity College in Cambridge. And by the time he's 16, so about two years afterwards, he's going to get married. And that's going to be the first of four wives. The reason why he's married to four different women is because three of them, unfortunately, pass away. Uh, the second of whom passes away during childbirth. Now, two years after he gets married to his first wife, so now he's 18, he's going to start practicing law. And then a few years later than that, he's going to get more involved in puritanical politics. And then he's also going to be getting involved into in with the or become a member of the Massachusetts Bay Company. Now, during the 1620s, a lot of things were going on within England, uh, ranging from economic hardships for people to social and theological change. Now, for Winthrop himself, the economic issues weren't a problem because, like I said, he was wealthy, but it disappointed him greatly, not only what was going on with regards to economics, but also what was going on on a social, cultural level there. For example, he was rallying against the, uh, the educational institutions of England, specifically those related to academic as well as theological. But maybe even more so, he was disappointed at the shifting of theological beliefs, which probably was one of the reasons why he called, and I'm going to quote him here, England a quote-unquote sinful land. And so what's going to happen is by 1629, uh, Winthrop is going to be elected to the Massachusetts Bay Company. He's, of course, going to be governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In fact, he's going to be governor 12 times. He's going to be lieutenant governor seven times. Um, and that's going to be established in 1630 after Winthrop and about 400 others get onto a ship called the Arbella and set sail to what eventually is going to be known as New England or the so-called New World. Now, jumping back to his influence on the Massachusetts Bay Colony, like I said, 12 times he's the governor, and seven times he's a lieutenant governor. So 19 years worth of leadership here. And as a result of this, this influence that he has, he's going to shape the colony's political economic, and religious institutions. And it's the latter part that's really, really important that we still see threads in today's society, in today's American society. So with regards to the latter, specifically religious concepts here, let's think about what Winthrop believed in. Or let me tell you about what he believed in. And primarily it was the importance that community, the community itself, came before the individual. And because of that, it was not an issue at all. In fact, it was a courage for that community, for society as a whole, for the government to regulate what's considered individual behavior in order to maintain social order. And so these ideas of community over the individual, they're going to be developed in a model Christian charity. So let's talk about that right now. So model Christian charity was delivered on that ship that I spoke about previously named the Arabella. As I said, there were about 400 people on there. And so that's your audience, about 400 individuals. And the purpose of the speech was, I don't want to call it sort of a pep speech, but it was definitely to sort of help these settlers get into the proper mindset to assuage any concerns or fears that they might have and conflicts that were going on among them. Because what he was saying in there, in addition to this idea of community above the individual, was that all these people on the Arabella, that they were on a mission from God that their mission to go to the so-called New World, to go to New England and establish the Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was ordained by God. And as a result, they were given the responsibility, God-given responsibility to not just build like this great colony, but to build a colony that was so good that it would become a model for everybody else to follow. 
And so he literally says that the Massachusetts Bay Colony can be a so-called city upon a hill. Now, you've probably heard that phrase before, and it's coming from Jesus Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You can find Jesus' Sermon on the Mount on Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. And I'm going to put it up here for you. I'm going to read it from you. And the version that we're reading is from the King James Version. It just seems to be most appropriate since Winthrop is making reference to it during the 1630s here. And it reads, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And so there's your city upon a hill reference. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So let's break this down real quick. It says, you're the light of the world. So obviously that's a Christian um, reference going on there. It's symbolic, the idea where Jesus says that he's the light of the world. So the light mean the Christians, the model, all those different things. Let's talk about this. The city on a hill. So it's not down in the valley. It's not him behind a wall. It's up on a hill where everybody can see. So that's important. So everybody can see it. So the second part talks about a candle. It says, what do you do with a candle? What do you do with a light? Do you, do you hide it away? Do you cover it? It says, no, what you do is you put it in a candlestick. And then with the candlestick, of course, what happens? Now it lights up the whole room or it lights up the whole house. So this candle that we're talking about, the light of a candle, it's in the house that's on the hill. And so now the whole hill is shining. The whole house is shining on that hill where everyone can see it and everyone can follow its lead, can follow its model. And so in Winthrop's eyes, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had to become and would definitely become the physical manifestation of Jesus's words. And in order to make manifest Jesus's words, Winthrop argued that the colony depended on the willingness of all the settlers to act as a community, to work together to put the interest of the community first or above their individual interests. He talked about individual interdependence. The idea that, yeah, we're individuals, but we should be depending on one another. We should be, I'm going to use Winthrop's words, we should be knit together and work towards the good of the whole. And let's take a look at some of the language that he used here. I'm going to read a, uh, an extended quote for you, actually, from Winthrop's piece. And I've left a lot of the original spelling in there. Not all of it, but a lot of the original spelling so you could get a better feel for it. So it reads, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work as members of the same body. So by doing this, by being knit together, the colony would become the so-called city upon a hill. And what it would do would set an example of righteousness and charity for the world. Now, furthermore, this would also strengthen the colony um, above all others. And Winthrop made the argument that not only by doing all these things that we talked about here, would the settlers serve as a beacon to guide other towards others towards Christian truth and salvation, but also what would happen is that God would, I'm going to quote from him, command a blessing upon the colony. Let's take a look at another quote from him. He goes on to say that we shall see much more of his wisdom power, goodness, and truth, the, the he of course, the his rather is God, then formerly we have been acquainted with. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us. And when 10 of us shall we be able to resist a thousand of our enemies. And when he shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it lightly that of New England. So this was his argument here. But remember, I did say that has application to the United States. So in a more modern sense, so now we're getting to today, more modern sense, the sermon is also considered one of the most important documents in American history, the United States history. And it's also cited as an early expression of something called American exceptionalism. 
Now, let's take a moment to define what American exceptionalism is. And Wikipedia does a good job of defining it for us. And so let me put it up there for you. And it reads, American exceptionalism is the belief that the United States is either distinctive, unique, or exemplary compared to other nations. Proponents of it argue that the values, political system, and historical developments of the United States are unique in human history, often with the implication that it is both destined and entitled to play a distinct and positive role on the world stage. Now, let's make this very clear. When you read a model of Christian charity, you're not going to see the phrase American exceptionalism. It's something that was coined by Alexei de Tocqueville. And when did Alexei de Tocqueville coin this phrase? Well, in his 1835 work called Democracy in America. So let's take a look at his quote real quick. So it reads that the position of the American is quite exceptional, and it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in a similar one. So this is where we get this concept here. But American exceptionalism isn't the only phrase that we've gotten from a model of Christian charity. And so the phrase itself, that famous phrase that probably sort of drew you here, was a city upon a hill. And so that phrase has also been adopted by the United States in a variety of ways there. And it really has become to represent for the United States, the city upon a hill, that the United States is a city upon a hill, that the U.S. is a shining example to the world and not Christian charity, but of freedom, democracy and moral leadership. Right. So that is sort of the the God ordained mission of the United States in a similar vein that Winthrop told the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Once the proof of that, well, Kennedy, John Kennedy, former presidents, John Kennedy and Ronald Reagan, they both invoked that phrase city upon the hill on a variety of levels there with Reagan, probably most famously in his 1989 farewell address in which he specifically compares the United States to the shining city upon the hill. More recently, President Barack Obama, or rather former President Barack Obama, he alluded to that portion of Reagan's speech. And then what he does, he meaning Obama does, he really um, develops this idea of American exceptionalism based on this concept that the United States is the so-called shining city on the hill. So while the model of Christian charity, of course, was delivered during this early colonial period, it's as well as, I guess, by extension, John Winthrop's theological belief system or theological worldview. So it's been embraced as an early expression of, like I said, American exceptionalism, which is a narrative, of course, the United States. And that also is, here's the final thought, it's a central concept of American identity and culture throughout its history. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a great day and take care. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye now.